an alien flying through our solar system past the outer planets would eventually reach the planet Earth. They would immediately recognize our planet Earth because of the division between the land and the sea. There's nowhere else in the solar system that looks like this. Liquid water at the surface is one of the big characteristics of our planet. Without it, we wouldn't be here, that's for sure. All forms of life we know about need water. Water covers two-thirds of the Earth's surface, and the rest of the Earth is washed by water, by rain and by snow, and it's continually reshaping the surface. We tend to take the division between land and sea for granted. We all think, yeah, we know that the sea's over there. But actually, the shoreline is geologically one of the most changeable features on the whole Earth. And I don't mean just like this. Here, we have some pictures of a hotel which is falling down. And this hotel is falling down because the sea is eroding the cliffs next to it, causing landslides, and the hotel is slipping into the sea. This is tragic, but not what I mean by big changes in the shoreline. What I mean is that 20,000 years ago, the North Sea wasn't there at all. That sea level all around the world was on average about 120 meters lower than it is today. You could walk to Denmark or France. The English Channel wasn't there. There was no need for the Channel Tunnel. The point is that shorelines and sea level have changed dramatically even in the short time that human beings have lived on the Earth. And this lecture is the story of how we came to understand what was going on, why these sea level changes occurred, and what they tell us about how the Earth works. The first clue in our story is our imaginary alien who flies past the Earth every 50 million years or so. If they flew past today, they would immediately notice this great white area over Greenland. This is the Greenland ice cap. And it may surprise you to know that we are living in an ice age with all this talk of global warming. What I mean by an ice age is we have permanent ice caps on the Earth. Most of the time, we don't. And at the moment, we are in a relatively warm period within this ice age, and the ice age has been going about two million years. But as well as the warm periods like today, there are also much colder periods, and in those colder periods, there is much more ice. This is a picture of today's ice cap over Greenland. In the much colder periods, there are, much, there are more ice caps. There's a big ice cap over Canada, and also over Europe and Scandinavia here. And of course, there would be lots of ice in the sea as well, but that's not very important, because there's always much, much more ice in the ice caps on land than in the sea. Now, if all that water is locked up in the ice in the ice caps, that's water which isn't in the oceans, and so sea level drops. And 22,000 years ago, which is when there was this maximum ice on Earth, the shoreline in Northern Europe looked quite different. Here's a map of Northern Europe. The British Isles are here. Scotland and Northern England and Ireland are totally buried underneath this white ice cap. Over here is another ice cap over Sweden and Norway. London would be about here. Edinburgh, right underneath this ice cap here. Over here, we would have Denmark, Germany, and France. Now, as that ice started to melt, the water was returned to the sea, and sea level rose. And the next pictures show the ice slowly retreating. By about 12,000 years ago, there was no more ice in the British Isles. By 8,000 years ago was about the last time you could walk to France, and the English Channel became flooded at about 6,000 years ago. <coughs> the Earth 10,000 years ago was quite a different place, and 10,000 years ago is not all that long. Jericho, one of the oldest cities in the world, mentioned in the Bible, it's in the Middle East. Jericho is a flourishing city 10,000 years ago. But Stockholm, the capital of Sweden, was at that time under two kilometers of ice. The North Sea wasn't there. And let's have a look at what an artist's impression would be of, say, midsummer in Scotland 10,000 years ago. Big ice sheets, a few hairy mammoths walking around the place. And because sea levels were much lower, these low levels of, sea, of the sea were probably part of the story of how mankind itself managed to escape from Africa into other continents. 
Here's where mankind originated in Africa and spread across the Bering Straits here into America because this was a land bridge. When sea level was low, this was land across here. There was land linking up the islands in Indonesia. You could get across here. There was land between Australia and Papua New Guinea. This is how mankind actually managed to populate these distant continents. So it's this very important part of our, our history. And during the last two million years, which is the present ice age, the Earth has really oscillated between these two conditions of having a little bit of ice, like today, or a lot of ice, like 20,000 years ago, with lower sea levels that went with it. And what the, this story is about today is the story of how we understood what was going on. What is actually causing all this huge change in the sea level and the ice? And the story really starts in about the 1960s, when it was realized that these tiny little creatures here in this picture may actually hold the key, the history, to, to our ice age. These are little creatures, they're less than a quarter of a millimeter in size, and they're called foraminifera, and they swim around in the sea. Now, how are they going to help our story? To do that, we need to actually just remind ourselves a little bit of chemistry. Water is a molecule which contains an oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. Now, oxygen atoms actually come in two weights. There's a lighter oxygen atom, which I'm going to color red here, and a heavier oxygen atom I'm coloring blue. And just to remind us which is which, I'm going to put them in the scales here. Red is going to be the lighter one, and blue is the heavier one. Now, how is that going to help us? To do that, we're going to need an experiment. This is supposed to represent a tank of water, the ocean. Here is the ocean. And the ocean is a mixture of these light molecules with light oxygen colored in red and heavy molecules, heavy oxygen colored in blue. So this is the light one. That's the heavy one. Now, in the Earth, in fact, the light one is about 500 times more abundant than the heavy one, but that's not going to bother us. We're going to be interested only in the ratio between those two. Now, when this water sits in the ocean, some of it evaporates. And when water evaporates, these molecules of water escape from being in the liquid to being in the atmosphere as water vapor. And to understand how that works, I'm going to ask for volunteers, please. We'll have... Oh, you two, please. And yes, you two, the girl in red and the boy next. Thank you. Sophie and... Ranulf. Ranulf. Sophie, I'd like you to come around here, please, this side. And Ranulf, you come here. And your names are? Emily and... Henry. And Henry. OK, Henry, you go there. Emily, actually, yeah, you come around here. That'll be fine. Now, I'm going to give you each a basket. We're going to put on the table. OK, thanks very much. Now, I'll explain what we're going to do. We're going to evaporate some of this water, and it's going to escape into the atmosphere, and some of it will land in your baskets, but some won't. That's how it is. So try and catch the ones that don't. Are you ready? OK. So let's, let's start evaporating this water. Right. Thank you. Well, what's happened? This water has evaporated, and it's made some water vapor, and you're holding water vapor or clouds. Let's pick up your basket and just, just come back here a little bit so people can see. Thank you very much. So now you have clouds. Now, your clouds are actually rather richer in these light red balls, the light oxygen atoms or, mole or water molecules, and that's because they're being lighter, they evaporate more easily. So the water vapor is actually rather rich in the light oxygen atoms, the red balls. And what's left behind here in the ocean will be much richer in the blue balls, the heavier ones, because they stay behind more. Now, of course, what normally happens is that water vapor just returns to the sea as rain. Either it rains in the sea or it rains on land and it gets washed in by rivers. So let's just return your clouds into the sea by rain. Could you just pour them back in? That's one at a time. Thank you very much. Can you reach? Good, thanks. 
So the rain has returned these to the sea, and nothing now has changed very much. But what happens if there's ice around? So this is actually quite fun anyway. So let's do it a second time <laughs> to see what happens when there's ice around. So ready? Right, we caught most of them that time. Right, thank you. So now come back again with your clouds of water vapour. And the clouds of water vapour are rich in these red balls, as before, with the light oxygen atoms. And what's left behind here should be mostly blue, more blue than, than red. Now, what is going to happen if there's ice about? If there's ice about, some of this water vapour is going to fall as snow and get locked up in the ice caps. So instead of returning it to the ocean, we'll make an ice cap out here. Can we pour your balls now onto the table instead? <laughs> Thanks very much indeed. And what we have here is an ice cap. Now this ice cap will actually be richer in the light water molecule with the light oxygen atom, the red one. And what's left behind in the ocean will be actually rather heavier. There'll be more of the blue balls in the ocean because they don't evaporate so easily. So when there's ice around, the oceans will have more of the heavier oxygen atoms in them. Thank you very much. Let's just take your <laughs> How is this going to help us? This should help us because the oceans should then be recording how much ice is around at the time. And these tiny little creatures, these foraminifera, have shells made of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate has oxygen, and these creatures are extracting the oxygen from the seawater to make their shells. And they will extract the oxygen from the seawater in the same ratio of light to heavy oxygen atoms as is in the seawater at the time. These little creatures then die, and their shells fall to the seabed and eventually become fossils. But they should be recording in them, they should be holding in them a record of what the light to heavy oxygen ratio was in the oceans at the time they were alive. So what we need to do then is sample these things from the sea to find out what the history was. And to do that, we take cores of sediment from the seabed. And let me explain what this is about. The way we get this is by taking a, a hollow drain pipe and you drive it into the mud on the seafloor, and of course it fills up with a cylinder of mud. You then bring your drain pipe up to the top, and you cut it in half lengthwise like this to give you a sediment core. Now this is the top of the core, which must be the present day, and this must, is, is the bottom of this core, which is of course older sediment, because the sediment comes out from the top and just lands on the, on the seabed. What we then do is extract from this mud these tiny creatures, these foraminifera, and we can analyze their shells to see what the ratio of light to heavy oxygen atoms in them actually is. And here's what happens when you do that. This is our core, and this is distance down the core in millimeters. So this is the top of the core, zero, and down here is 1.6 meters. And what this white line is, is the variation of that ratio between light, red, balls and blue heavy balls in the shells of these little creatures. And you can see it varies as we go down the core. And up here, where it's red, that's to show you that, yes, there are lots of light oxygen atoms in the water. In other words, probably that means that there's not much ice around, we think. Down here, where it's blue, that means that there's lots of the blue balls or the heavy oxygen atoms in the shells of the little creatures, and that's because a lot of the light ones are tied up in ice sheets somewhere. That's what we think. But is this right? Is this right? Is this thing really showing us how the ice volume is changing in the Earth? How do we know? And why should it vary like this? Well, the first problem is we don't really know how old any of this is. How far down the core do you have to go to get to a certain age? And how was that solved? Well, that problem was solved in a way which is going to be familiar to you from earlier lectures. The sediment which is filtering out from the sea to lie on the seafloor contains little tiny grains of iron oxide. 
Now, iron oxide is magnetic. They're like little magnets, these things. And as they fall to the seabed, they get aligned. They align themselves in the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. Now, the Earth's magnetic field, you might remember, is a rather odd thing. It looks as though it's coming from a bar magnet in the middle of the Earth. Here's a bar magnet lined up with the Earth's rotation axis, for example. And here's my magic wand, which is another bar magnet, which can actually rotate and move. And if I bring this magic wand up to this bar magnet, it will swing round and line itself up so that the red end of my wand is pointing at the yellow end of the bar magnet. Now, the Earth's magnetic field has this curious habit of flipping suddenly. Every now and then, it just turns over. And the North Magnetic Pole becomes the South Magnetic Pole. And so now, of course, my little magic wand will point the yellow end towards the red end of this magnet. So the Earth's magnetic field flips. And what we find, looking at the magnetism of the tiny grains of iron oxide in this core, and actually to measure simply the magnetization in that core of these tiny grains of iron oxide, was an incredible achievement. The magnetization is extremely weak. Very weak indeed. But there are instruments that can do it. And what you find is this. As you go down the core from the top, you find all those little grains are aligned in the direction of the Earth's magnetic field today. That's what you would expect. But as you get down the bottom of the core, around about here, you find that they've all changed. They're actually lined up in the opposite direction from the present-day Earth's magnetic field. And that's because the Earth's magnetic field had flipped at this time. And just to show you what it looks like, here's what it looks like. And this is a real core we're looking at from the Pacific Ocean in this picture. It looks like that. That here in black, all the little iron oxide grains are lined up in the direction of the present-day magnetic field. And here is where it flipped. Now, the point is, we know when it flipped. It last flipped 700,000 years ago. So we know that this point in the core is 700,000 years old. And up here, it's the present day. And because the, we can, this core, which comes from the middle of the Pacific Ocean, where things don't change much, the rate of sediment falling to the seafloor is the same for a long time, we can make a guess, then, at what all the times are in between. And we can, therefore, date our core. We know what age is at what depth. Now, this was first done by these three people here. James Hayes, John Imbry, and Nick Shackleton. And this was a famous bit of work they did in 1976, which put time onto this variation of the light and heavy oxygen atoms in the cores. But they did much more than that. Let me show you what they did by coming here again. What they did was this. Let me just show you what we're looking at. This was the, the core we've just been looking at, with the variation of the light to heavy oxygen atoms as we go down the core. I'm now going to show you a detail of this. Okay? I'm going to show you the, the first half of this picture, and that's what this is here. So this is now a detail. But what we can do now is put time on it, because we know now how deep in the core you have to get to get to a certain age. And this is the present day, now, today, and this is 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, 400,000 years, all within the present ice age, remember, which has lasted so far 2 million years. So we're looking at how the light to heavy oxygen atom ratio varies with time now. And this dotted line is the present day ratio. And you can see at the moment we're here in what looks like a red period. In other words, there are lots of light oxygen atoms in the sea, and that's because there's not very much ice around. Down here in blue would be when there are much more heavy oxygen atoms proportionately in the sea. And that's because there's a lot of ice around, probably here, which has caught the thing up. So the, the, uh, the ice has tied up the lighter oxygen atoms. But still we're seeing these variations. What does this variation mean? Is this really true, what I've been saying to you? Now what these three did, Hayes, Imbri, and Shackleton, was this. They, said, they pointed out that this pattern is not a random pattern. It's a regular pattern, and this variation is actually made up of three different um, periods or frequencies that are changing here. Now, the first one is 100,000 years. What I have here is a curve which has peaks every 100,000 years. Now, if I line this up to this, this uh, variation here, you can see that the main peaks here are at about 100,000 years apart. And this is the first frequency or changing 
uh, rate of change that they saw in this variation. They found another one at 40,000 years. Here's another curve with 40,000 years between the peaks. And if you match this one up, you can see that there are other peaks here which are sort of 40,000 years apart. This is another frequency which they found in this variation. And the third one they found was this one, which is 20, 22,000 years, in fact, between these peaks here. And if you match this up, you can see that this variation of the light and heavy oxygen atom ratios has some peaks which are about 22,000 years apart. This is what they did. And this was a very triumphant paper. This was a huge razzmatazz. They said, we have discovered the pacemaker of the ice ages. Well, why? You know, it sounds like an odd thing to have done. <coughs> What's all this about? The reason there was so much fuss was because someone had, in 1941 had predicted that that is precisely what should be going on. And let me show you a picture of him and tell you about this man. This man was a Yugoslav mathematician. His name was Milutin Milankovic. And what he had done was actually produce a theory which predicted precisely how the great ice sheets of the Earth should grow and retreat, how frequently they should do it. And that is, let me tell you a little bit then about how he had made his theory, what it was about. He said this. He said, ice, of course, forms mostly at the poles of the Earth because they're going to be the coldest places. And what's actually going to matter are two things. What's going to matter is how much sun's radiation is going to actually hit the poles, how warm these places are going to get. And that will depend on how much the Earth is tilted towards the sun, firstly. So if this is the sun, that light over there, the Earth may be tilted towards the sun, or in which case the poles will actually get a lot of sun's radiation, or they may be tilted rather more away from the sun, and they will get rather less. So that's one of, one of the things that mattered. And the other thing which mattered is how far away the Earth was from the Sun. If I take the Earth further away, the intensity of the Sun's radiation will be less. Now, he said that those two things are actually going to vary with time because of the way that the Earth orbits the Sun. And let me explain what that is about. To do this, I'm going to have to become the Sun. So this is just to remind you that I'm the Sun in this. And uh, Bryson's going to give me the Earth. Thank you, Bryson. Here we have the Earth. Now the Earth orbits the Sun, me, as you know, and I'll show you the shape of the orbit. It's an orbit like this. It's an ellipse. The Earth orbits the Sun not quite like a circle, but as an ellipse, and the Sun is not quite at the center of this ellipse. It's over to one side, and so the Earth is sometimes rather closer to the Sun, and other times further away from the Sun. That difference is not very much. It's about 10 million kilometers, which, when you consider the average distance of the Earth from the Sun is 150 kilometers, that's not a big difference. But the point is that that varies with time. And that sometimes the closest approach of the Earth to the Sun is a little bit closer than at other times, and the furthest distance away is a little bit further than at other times. And that varies with a period of 100,000 years. And that's where the first of those periods comes from, which they discovered in the variation of the oxygen, light to heavy oxygen atoms. That's where the first one comes from. <coughs> Thanks, Bryson. The second thing which happens is that as the Earth orbits the Sun, the axis of rotation of the Earth is tilted in the plane of that orbit. And the tilt of the Earth in that plane varies with time. Not by much. It changes from about a little bit less than 22 degrees to a little bit more than 24 degrees. It's not a big effect. But it changes backwards and forwards very regularly with a period of 40,000 years. And that's where the second of those three periods that they found comes from. And the third thing which matters is that as the Earth is orbiting the Sun, it's spinning. And like a lot of things that spin, like this top, as it spins, it wobbles, just like that top is wobbling. The Earth wobbles as well. And the Earth wobbles with a period of 22,000 years. And that's where the third of those frequencies came from. Thank you. Let me just remind you what we're talking about here then. So as the Earth 
tilt changes. It changes backwards and forwards very slowly over 40,000 years. As it's changing like that, it's also wobbling, and the wobbling changes over 22,000 years. To just help us visualize that, here we have an animation. Here is the sun, and the shape of the Earth's orbit is shown here, going round the sun. And I'm going to show you four positions of the Earth, just to show you what's going on. Over here, we have the northern hemisphere slightly reddish colored, because it's tilted towards the sun. This is summer in the northern hemisphere. Here, the northern hemisphere is a blue, cold color, and that's because it's pointing away from the sun. That's winter in the northern hemisphere. And here is autumn, and here's spring. Now, as we now let it go forward, let it run now, we can see the shape of that orbit changing as it goes uh, backwards and forwards. We can see the tilt of the Earth changing, and we can also see the Earth wobbling as it goes around. It makes me feel a bit seasick doing this. You probably didn't realize the Earth was doing this all the time. These are actually very small effects, but they combine to actually determine how much sun's radiation is actually going to fall at the poles of the Earth. And what Milankovic realized was that what matters is how that interacts with the seasons on the Earth. Let me explain what I mean. That if, supposing we have a particularly cold winter at the North Pole, that's actually not going to make much difference, because the North Pole is so cold anyway, we're going to get ice in winter. But supposing, instead, we have a particularly cold summer, ah, that matters, because then that ice, which would normally melt a little bit in the summer, won't melt if the summer's particularly cold, and that gives a very good foundation for making more ice the next winter, because it hasn't got to catch up that lost ice which would have been melted before. And this is the effect which matters. And what Milankovitch did was work out how the great ice sheets of the Earth should be growing and retreating as a result of these effects. What he did was provide a reason for why this variation between the light and the heavy oxygen atoms should look like this. He provided the reason. And what he predicted was precisely those frequencies of 100,000 years, 40,000 years, 22,000 years, and that's exactly what you see in the oceans. This is why it was so exciting. What Milankovitch had discovered was what is sometimes called the pulse beat of the ice ages. And Milankovic unfortunately died before he ever saw his great theory proven. He, he wrote it all up in 1941, and he died in 1958. And there's a very moving interview with his son just before he died, because his son said to him, why isn't it you never did anything else after this? And Milankovic said something I want to read to you, because it's very interesting. He said, once you catch a large fish, you cannot be bothered with the small ones anymore. For 25 years, I've been working on my theory of solar radiation, and now that it is completed, I am without work. I am too old to start a new theory, and theories of the magnitude of the one I have completed do not grow on trees. <coughs> I think he's right. Milankovitch's theory for the pulse beat of the ice ages and Vine and Matthew's theory for the seafloor spreading in the oceans, those are the two theories which have changed our view of the Earth more than any others. Now we can actually do something else. Now that we know that the variation of this light to heavy oxygen uh, atom ratio in the oceans is caused by the retreat and the growth of the ice ages, we can do something else. We can say, well, how much ice do we need to change that ratio of light to heavy oxygen atoms by a certain amount? And if we know how much ice is needed to be in the ice caps in order to do that, we know how much water is missing from the oceans, and we can work out where the sea level would have been. So we can turn this variation of light and heavy oxygen atoms into a sea level variation. So let's do it. I'm just going to peel the top off here. And now we have sea level variation. And this dotted line here, which is the present day ratio of light to heavy oxygen atoms, is now the present day sea level. And you can see we're living at a period of very high sea level. It's, very, it's hardly ever been higher than this in the past. It was a little bit higher, perhaps, 120,000 years ago. But it comes back to this kind of uh, sea level when most of the ice has melted. And at other times, the sea level is very, very much lower. Here, 20,000 years ago, sea level was 120 meters lower than it is now because all that water was locked up in the ice caps. I still think it's, find it amazing that this variation of the ice growing and retreating is actually controlled by something outside the Earth altogether. By the way, the Earth orbits the sun. But it's not right to think that 
the Earth is actually just a dead ball in space being influenced by things from outside. The Earth has an atmosphere, ice, oceans, and land, and these things actually interact to modify what is coming at it from space. And to give you an idea of quite how that works, I want to actually draw attention to something here, which is this incredibly fast rise in sea level which happened since the last big glaciation 20,000 years ago. And one of the ways that can happen is illustrated in this little model here. Here we have a bit of land and a bit of sea. To remind us it's a sea, I'm going to put a shark in the sea here. And this is going to be a bit of ice, which is sitting on the land. Here's ice, an ice cap on the land. Now, ice is very, very good at reflecting back the sun's radiation. Ice is like a mirror. It reflects the sun's radiation back into space, and that is radiation which otherwise would have been absorbed by the Earth to warm the Earth's surface. Now, the sea, on the other hand, is very, very good at absorbing the sun's radiation. It's excellent at doing that. Now, supposing we're just at one of those times when the ice is just about ready to grow, just cooling a little bit, the ice wants to grow, and it grows a little bit. If the ice grows a little bit, that means it's reflecting even more of the sun's radiation back into space. And that radiation, therefore, has not helped to warm the Earth, and the Earth will cool a little bit more. And because it cools a little bit more, the ice grows a little bit more. That means that even more of the sun's radiation is reflected back into space, and it grows a bit more. So it can grow quite quickly in this way. And to, we would then have a much larger ice cap. And just to remind us of that, we have a few polar bears. Let's just put a couple of polar bears on here. And now let's look at the, what happens in reverse. Supposing we now get to a period where the ice is just about to retreat, and it retreats a little tiny bit here, then suddenly that's a little bit less of this mirror, a little bit less of the sun's radiation which is reflected back into space, and a little bit more which is absorbed by the oceans. So the oceans get a little bit warmer, and then they melt a little bit more of the ice. So the ice retreats a bit more, and that's even more, even less sun's radiation reflected back into space, so the oceans get even warmer, and the ice retreats really quickly like that. So the, the ice sheets can actually grow and retreat really fast. That is the point. Now, we're going to have a small digression. I'm going to show you a picture of a rock in the Baltic Sea. This is the Baltic Sea between Sweden and Finland. And up here is a rock, rather scruffy looking rock. Here it is, and it's actually a rather famous rock. This rock, we know, in 1583, was a favorite place for catching seals in the sea. Seals used to sit on top of these, this rock, which was just below the sea surface. They used to bask there in the sunshine, having a nice time, and people would come along and hunt them. Now, in 1731, a famous man went to visit this rock, and his name was Anders Celsius. He was a Swedish mathematician, and he is the person after whom the Celsius temperature scale is named. And he went to visit this rock because he had heard tales of how it was rising out of the sea. And when he went to see it, he drew the sea level on and this little line just here, and he marked it 1731, which is when he went to visit it. Now, a hundred years later, another famous person came to look at this rock, a man called Charles Lyell, one of the great geologists of the 19th century, and he went to visit it because he had heard stories that Celsius's rock was coming out of the sea. And when he went to see it in 1835, they drew another line on down here, saying 1835, because Celsius's sea level had been lifted out of the sea by about a metre by that time. We can ignore all this scruffy writing here, which is something else. And in 1931, they made another mark on this rock, which is now down here. That's where sea level was in 1931. And this rock is rising out of the sea at about a metre every century. And all around that part of the Baltic Sea, the shoreline is rising out of the sea. There are Viking harbours, a thousand years old, which are 10 metres out of the sea, completely useless as harbours. So the whole of that shoreline is coming out of the sea. And we can draw a map of just what it looks like. It's a sort, these are contours of how fast the shoreline is coming out of the sea. And our rock was in the middle here of this bullseye pattern. That's where it's coming out fastest, and it's coming out less quickly as we go away from the middle there. Now, what is this bullseye pattern about? What it is about is shown in this little model here. If you put an ice sheet on the Earth, the Earth sinks a little bit because of the weight of the ice sheet. The ice sheet presses down on the surface of the Earth, and down underneath, those hot rocks flowing like potty putty, they creep out of the way. Okay? And here is our ice sheet 
resting on the Earth. What happens if we remove the ice sheet? Because the ice sheet can melt really quite quickly. So let's remove our ice sheet with the polar bears, take it away. And what actually happens then is the land bounces out of the sea. Here's where the, the shoreline used to be, this line in red. And here it is, bouncing slowly out of the sea, and the shoreline is retreating. And that's happening because those rocks which we pushed out of the way underneath because we put the ice sheet on top are now slowly flowing back in to where they were before. And as they flow back in, they push the land back up. And that is what is happening back here in Scandinavia. This bullseye pattern in Scandinavia is actually exactly the same shape as the Scandinavian ice sheet. It was pushed down most in the middle here, and it's now bouncing up most in the middle. And it's bouncing up because the rocks deep down, which have been pushed out of the way, are now flowing back towards the middle of where that ice sheet was and lifting the land up. And in fact, they're flowing back towards Scandinavia from under us. So we're actually going down slightly at the moment here, as all that rock is flowing gently towards Scandinavia. So although the ice actually finished melting, 6,000 years ago, those rocks are still gently flowing back underneath where the ice was. And the ice is giving us our best estimate of just how quickly those rocks are flowing back. As the Baltic is coming up about a centimetre a year, that kind of rate. And without the help from the ice, it would be very hard for us to make an estimate of just how runny it is down there. Let's just remind ourselves where we've got to. Sea level today is about as high as it's ever been in the last two million years, within our present ice age. It was the same as it was about 120,000 years ago. That's the last time it was about now. And it's not likely to really go much higher than it is today, unless something else happens. And that unless something else could be us. We're not quite sure what mankind's influence on all this is. If we do make the climate a bit warmer, we may be heading for a higher sea level. That is why people are interested in all this. But further back in time, it's clear that the Earth's history, mostly, there's been no permanent ice on the continents. But ice ages come and go on a time scale of maybe 30 to 100 million years. And that is the clue to what's going on. Because Milankovitch's theory, which tells us how the ice sheets grow and come back and so on, those, that is caused by the way the Earth orbits the Sun. And that's not changed throughout the Earth's history. So Milankovitch's theory can't tell us why there are ice ages. If we happen to have an ice age, they will tell us how the ice will grow and retreat during the ice age, but not why we have an ice age in the first place. There's got to be some other reason for that. And what we're learning by looking at how ice ages occurred in the past, at 300 million years, 400, 600, and so on, is that ice ages come and go on about the time scale it takes to rearrange the continents at the surface of the Earth by plate tectonic movements, by continental drift. And so the arrangement of the continents has probably got something to do with all this. And if we look at the arrangement of the continents today, we can see that actually it's very favorable for making ice. If we look at the Arctic Ocean here by the North Pole, the Arctic Ocean is almost completely landlocked. So when ice grows on the surrounding continents, that ice is pretty safe. It won't get warmed up by the sea because the warm water from the equator flowing northward simply can't get at the Arctic Ocean, can't get in there. It's almost completely landlocked. And that's why the ice can stay cold. If we look at the other end of the Earth, the Antarctic, in the Antarctic, we have a big continent, Antarctica, right slap over the South Pole. That's another very good place to grow ice because the ice can grow on the land and the sea can't get at it. To, to warm it up and melt it. And we can test whether that's really likely, whether that's anything to do with why we have ice ages, by looking at what the continents were like last time there was an ice age, which was 300 million years ago. 300 million years ago, the arrangement of the continents looked like this. This was our supercontinent, Gondwana land, which we've seen before. And if we look at where the evidence was for ice at that time, we can see that that evidence points to one huge big ice cap here, with maybe a little <laughs> few smaller ones round about. But that big ice cap centered over the position of the South Pole. So again, 300 million years ago, there was an ice age because there was a big continent over the South Pole, just like today. So to understand ice ages, we have to actually understand the movement of the continents. This is another example of how you need to know how the whole planet works to understand a part of it, like ice ages. 
Now, ice ages and the changes in sea level are just the most dramatic consequences of having water on the surface of the Earth. But water has other effects, too. And that's how we started this lecture, worrying about water on the Earth. Water reshapes our surface the whole time by washing over it, eroding rocks, wearing down the mountains. That's how we are able to look deep into the roots of mountains to see what's in the heart of the mountains. And water, of course, dumps lots of sediment onto the seafloor. When water breaks down rocks, it releases chemicals into the sea and into the atmosphere. And by acting as the agent for the interaction between atmosphere and ocean, water is probably one of the main things which controls climate on the Earth, even if we don't have any ice around. Now, one way to understand, help us understand just how important water is on the Earth is to actually stand back a little bit and think, well, what would the Earth be like if we didn't have water? Or if we had it but lost it? Or if the surface temperature of the Earth was not right for having liquid water. Now, that's actually an experiment we can do, because round about us in the solar system are places just like that. Let's have a look at some. The nearest one to us is the moon. The moon is dry and dead. There's no water there. We know we've been there, after all, to the moon. And there are no rocks younger than about 3,000 million years on the moon. And what you notice immediately when you look at the moon, if I show you the next picture, which is of the south pole of the moon, is it's completely pockmarked with meteorite craters. It's been blasted. And it's a reminder of just how violent the early history of the solar system was. We would look like that if it wasn't for water. Water has eroded our continents and washed away all the evidence of that. But we can see it on the moon. And if we look in detail at one of the meteorite impacts on the moon, here's the meteorite impact. It sprayed material all around it because there's no water, and it's been preserved. You can actually see very clearly what's gone on. What about Mars? Mars is the next, the next nearest thing to us. Here's a picture of the planet Mars. And now Mars is much smaller than the Earth. It's about the size of the Earth's core. And because it's much smaller, it has a much weaker gravity field and a much thinner atmosphere. It's just not very good at holding on to its atmosphere. So the atmospheric pressure on Mars is about a 50th of what it is on the Earth, and that's going to matter in this story. Because Mars today has no liquid water at the surface. But there are all sorts of interesting signs that perhaps Mars did have liquid at the surface once. Here's a picture of some what look awfully like river channels. These little stream channels here all joining together look just like river channels do on Earth, and yet this is on Mars. Here's another picture of a, of a meandering valley here with lots of curly, wiggly uh, outlines, looks just like a meandering river channel on Earth. Here's another piece of evidence. If we look at the shape of meteorite impact craters on Mars, they are quite different from the ones on the Moon. I'll show you a close-up of one of these pictures here. Here's the edge of a meteorite crater, and around this meteorite crater we have what looks like a great splurge, a great sort of mud pat coming out of this, well, around the, the rim of this meteorite crater. And they do look quite different from those on the moon. Now, let's, let's do an experiment here just to show us that. I have two volunteers. Yes, would you like to come? And let's have someone else. Yes, why don't you come too? So, give me your names. Victoria. Victoria, you're in charge of Mars, it turns out. And you're... Helen. Helen, you're going to be uh, looking after the moon. Okay, are you ready for mating meteorite impacts on the moon? So, grab some meteorites here. We'll do the moon first, I think. Okay, Helen, so you grab some of these. And I want you to drop them into this tray here to make meteorite impacts on the moon. Great. Lob some in, a bit more in. Let's see, I'll help you. It's good fun, isn't it? So meteorite impacts on the moon look as though they're spraying powder everywhere because the moon is dry place. It's not got much atmosphere. It's got no atmosphere. That's why this stuff can spray everywhere. Now, Victoria's going to have a go at Mars. Are you ready for this? So grab some meteorites here, and let's drop them into this tray, which is rather different, to make meteorite impact some Oh, lovely. Great. I'll help you too. I enjoy doing this. Right, thank you. This, I think you get the message. That this, which is a sort of slurpy, muddy, nasty-looking, wet stuff, makes quite a different shape of meteorite impact crater from the dry craters that we see on the moon. Thank you very much. And people have used the shape of these meteorite impacts on Mars to argue that, yeah, it looks as though the, the ground was kind of wet and sloppy, and that's why we have this particular shape of meteorite impact crater. 
But one of the strangest pieces of evidence for water on Mars is a story which starts with a meteorite which landed on the Earth in 1911. A meteorite fell out of the sky into a little village in Egypt, and it hit a dog, killed the dog. It's about the most famous dog in the history of Earth sciences, is this. <laughs> we no longer have the dog, but we have the meteorite, and here it is. And it's brought in by Monica Grady of the Natural History Museum. Welcome, Monica. Thank you. And Monica has brought this in because this is not allowed out of her sight. This is an absolutely priceless thing. There are only about 10 of them in the world. This is a meteorite from Mars. How do we know it's from Mars, you're thinking? Let me tell you how we know this is from Mars. Firstly, this is a rock which solidified from a magma, from molten liquid. Okay? And it's 1,300 million years old, which is much younger than most meteorites. Most meteorites are 4,550 million years old, which is the age of the solar system. This is very much younger. And it has to have come from a place which had volcanoes active 1,300 million years ago, which really means a planet of some sort has to have come from a planet. But there's something else we can do. Within this meteorite are tiny little blobs of glass. And the glass formed because this melted a little bit. And it melted and then immediately froze to make glass. But as it froze, it captured little tiny bubbles of the atmosphere where this thing formed. And we can take those little glass blobs now, we can melt them and release that atmosphere and analyze it. And that atmosphere has exactly the same composition as the atmosphere on Mars. We know. We've been to Mars. There have been space probes to Mars. We've sampled the Mars atmosphere. We know what's in it. So this really does come from Mars. And I'm amazed that I can hold in my hand a piece of Mars. I find this terribly exciting. I haven't seen this one before. So how did it come to be on the Earth? Well, the reason it came to Earth is because Mars, having such a miserable gravity field and thin atmosphere, when Mars is hit by a really big meteorite, it knocks bits off. Bits fly off Mars, and they go off into space, and they orbit around, and they land on Earth. That's what this thing is about. So why am I telling you all this about this Mars meteorite? The reason I'm telling you about it is this, that within this meteorite are minerals which only form in the presence of water. That is why this is important. So there, without question, Mars did have water once. Thank you, Monica. I can see Monica looking protective. <laughs> Thank you very much. So the question is, if Mars had water once, does it have water still now? Mars has an ice cap. Here's a picture of the pole, one of the poles of Mars with a big white ice cap. Now this is actually not water ice mostly, it's dry ice. It's frozen carbon dioxide because Mars is so cold. But there are people who think that underneath this frozen carbon dioxide is actually also frozen water, and that frozen water might also be in the ground of Mars, and just below the surface as, as frozen water or ice. And that occasionally what happens is that ice melts and water runs over the surface of Mars, making those rivers and channels, and then evaporates into space. If that's what happened, Mars is going through these incredible climate changes between ice and being frozen right now and having water running over its surface as in the past. Well, what on Earth is responsible for that? On the Earth, we reckon what's responsible for having ice ages or not is in the end where the continents are. In other words, the rearrangement of the Earth's surface. Does Mars have a way of rearranging its surface? Well, we can certainly see things like faults and volcanoes and so on on Mars. Here's a picture of a lava flow on Mars. This great tongue sticking out here is a lava flow dribbling out from a which has dribbled out from a volcano somewhere down here. And this lava flow is sliced up by faults. There's no question that there are faults on Mars. But what we don't see is that those faults organized into any system resembling at all the plate boundaries we see on Earth. We can't really see how Mars can rearrange its surface. If that's the case, then there must be some other way in which you can have these huge climate changes which doesn't involve moving continents about or rearranging the surface. If that's right, we don't know quite what it is. It's a bit of a puzzle. Well, what about Venus? Venus is almost exactly the same size as the Earth. And it'll be made of the same stuff as the Earth. It's a little bit closer to the sun, so it gets a bit more sun's radiation. It'll be a little bit hotter than the Earth. But that would only account for about a 50 degree difference. In fact, the surface of Venus is 450 degrees centigrade. It's hot enough to melt lead. It's got an atmosphere of really thick carbon dioxide with some sulfuric acid, 
which is so dense it's equivalent, it's 90 times the atmospheric pressure on Earth. It's equivalent to being under about a kilometer of water. Venus is an extremely nasty place. And one famous astronomer referred to it once as the conventional image of hell. Pretty good description. Venus is so hot because of that atmosphere of carbon dioxide, and it's a classic greenhouse effect. And it's worth thinking that if it wasn't for life on Earth, we might be like that. What life on Earth does is remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and turn it into oxygen. Without the early evolution of life on the Earth, maybe the Earth's fate would have been like Venus. Venus is far too hot to have liquid water at the surface. Really, it's all evaporated, gone. Some's in the atmosphere, but a lot of it, we think, has escaped. And when you look at Venus from, from space or from the Earth, you really can't see much. It's a cloudy mess because of this atmosphere. But one of the most successful of NASA's space missions in the last few years was the Magellan mission, which mapped the surface of Venus using radar, which strips away the clouds, and you can see what's underneath. And there's a very nice simulation here of what it would be like to fly over the surface of Venus. Here we are, have meteorite impact craters we're looking at at the surface of Venus here. And not surprisingly, they look rather different from meteorite impact craters on Mars or the Moon. Only the bigger meteorites actually make it through at all, and they don't spray stuff out very far because of the very thick, dense atmosphere. And let's just make some meteorite impact craters on Venus, because this is a good one. Who'd like to do this? Yes, why don't you come here? Thank you very much. And what's your, what's your name? Isabel Wright, are you ready for making <laughs> impact craters on Venus? I just want you to take these and just start lobbing them in. Oh, you can give your hand. Just lob them in. Okay. And here we are making meteorite impact craters on Venus. And not surprisingly, they do actually will look different from Mars and the Moon. But the reason we're doing this is actually, keep going, keep going, is because Isabel's actually doing something rather interesting. You can tell how long she's been doing it by how many of these things there are. And that is the way we can actually date the surface of Venus. Let me remind you what I mean by that. All the planets are about the same age, 4,500 million years old. But the planets can actually resurface themselves. The Earth is being resurfaced the whole time by plate tectonics. If we look at the average age of the Venus surface, it's about 500 million years old. And we do it by looking at the density of these meteorite impact craters. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, why am I telling you that? Because the average age of the Earth's surface is also about 500 million years. Same as Venus. But the Earth's surface is divided into very, very old continents, 3,000 million years old or older, and very, very young oceans, the average age of 60 million years. We can also, we can see whether that's true in Venus, because there might be areas which simply don't have any impact craters, which might be very young, and other places which have a lot, which are very old. But that's not what you see on Venus. What you see on Venus is there's a uniform density of impact craters all over the place. Venus seems to have the same age of surface everywhere. Well, how does Venus do it? How does it renew its surface? Well, again, there is evidence for faults and volcanoes on Venus. Here is a picture from the Magellan mission of a rift valley in Venus. These bright lines going top to bottom in this picture are faults in a rift valley. This round object here is a meteorite crater which has actually been split by these faults, and the other bit, other edge of it is over here on the right. This is a rift valley. There are other pictures of things which we think might be faults. This is a rather odd picture of sort of crisscrossing faults or fractures. No one's quite sure what these are, but we think they are faults or fractures. You can see this kind of thing on Venus, okay, but once again, what you don't see is any organization of these faults and fractures into anything which we would recognize as plate tectonics. And this is very worrying. Here's this planet which is the same size as the Earth, made of the same stuff, and it's behaving quite differently, and we don't know why. Maybe in the end, the reason why is related to the fact that perhaps Venus has lost a lot of its water. But we don't know. It may be water again. Now, the way we've actually view our planet has changed almost beyond recognition in the last 30 years. And many of the fundamental insights have come from completely unexpected directions. And it may be that you will actually make the next breakthrough in understanding the Earth by looking at something completely odd and unexpected. Maybe, for example, one of the moons of Jupiter. The moons of Jupiter are really interesting. Let me just show you a couple. Here is 
a picture of Io, which is one of the moons of Jupiter. It's very small, about the size of our moon. But unlike our moon, this is not dead at all. When Voyager spacecraft flew past it, it saw a volcano erupting. And this is a volcano erupting on Io. The interesting thing about Io is that its surface is covered in sulfur. And there's a big argument at the moment. Do these volcanoes on Io actually erupt liquid sulfur? Or do they erupt the same kind of magmas that we see on Earth? We're not quite sure. The heat for these volcanoes on Io comes because Io is sandwiched between Jupiter, which is a huge planet, and all the other moons of Jupiter. And they pull it apart by tidal forces. So poor little Io is being stretched and compressed and stretched and compressed, and this heats it up. And that's where the source of heat's coming from, completely different source of heat from the Earth. Another moon of uh, Jupiter is called Europa. Here it is. It looks like a sort of glassy, cracked surface. The surface of Europa is ice, and that ice probably is 100 kilometers or more thick. Ice, under those conditions of pressure and temperature, can behave like rocks. It can flow, and it can break to make faults, and so on. The point is, we think we know about volcanoes and plates, but do we know about them when they're made of ice and when volcanoes are erupting sulfur? The thing is, the Earth has a habit of leaving the keys to its puzzles in the most unlikely places. In the first lecture, we were talking about what's at the center of the Earth. And who would have thought that to answer that question, you needed to know about volcanoes and earthquakes and meteorites and what's in the sun and what the magnetic field of the Earth was about. Or that to discover plate tectonics, you had to know about reversals of the Earth's magnetic field. Or, as in the last lecture, where I showed that the secret to understanding why the North Sea was there, which has all our oil, actually came from looking at earthquakes in Greece. Or today, how we learnt that the secret to understanding the growth and retreat of the great ice sheets, the pulse beat of the Ice Age, would actually be contained in the subatomic chemistry of those tiny little organisms called foraminifera. We live on this lovely planet, the Earth. There's lots that we don't understand about it. But the lesson from these discoveries of the last 30 years is quite clear. It is that we should think about the whole planet if we want to understand how any part of it works. Thank you very much. Thank you.